Um, hello everybody. We are going to be talking about jet airline and takeoff performance now. And uh, just a few words about me, just to say I did work in a section that was responsible for uh, doing performance and weights analysis for an airline and also evaluating new aircraft types. But this flight performance is an interesting aspect and uh, we'll start by discussing the takeoff performance of airliners, in particular the 707, Boeing 707. We know that's an old aircraft, but at the same time, uh, it's very instructive to go through the graphs that are used to establish a takeoff performance. And uh, we'll, after the explanatory part, we'll have a, a time where we can look at an actual uh, work out of this and we'll learn from it. Now how do modern jet airliners, the pilots of, ensure they have the correct information to make successful takeoffs? This information must account for any combination of runway and atmospheric conditions, aircraft configuration and handling engine failure, to name the most important. We will see how this is achieved in practice. The information is obtained from MAKERS performance documents approved by the civil aviation agencies of various nations. Today we will discuss those approved by the United States Federal Aviation Agency, uh, Federal Aviation Authority, FAA. Their regulation is called the FAR 25. There is also another special uh, regulation SR422B and Europe has its own JAR25. The performance information the pilots need when taking off is the maximum permissible weight when the aircraft releases its brakes at the threshold of the runway and three takeoff speeds V1, VR and V2 as well as the engine power settings. This information is available for each aircraft type and version in its FAA approved flight manual. The aircraft type is then issued with a certificate of airworthiness after satisfactorily demonstrating that its performance meets FAA requirements. For today we will look at an aircraft certified uh, to FAR uh, 25. In other words, the aircraft man manufacturer must, by means of many tests throughout the operating regime of the aircraft, show that its performance complies with these requirements. The, these are not theoretically based derived results. Rather, everything must be demonstrated using aircraft at these various, under these various conditions. Airlines, of course, the customer in turn, um, are required by law to operate the aircraft in such a way that these requirements will be met. As an aside, please note that multi-engine aircraft lighter than 5,700 kilograms are certificated to a less restrictive FAA regulation part 23. We are not going to discuss that tonight. Most countries normally permit operation of aircraft to FAA standards without modification. As we know, the USA, even in aviation matters, is still not metricated. So for simplicity, all of what we will do today is in the old-fashioned aviation units. Interestingly enough as well, no major changes in basic concepts concerning the takeoff analysis have taken place in the last 50 years. Of course, aircraft manufacturers operators now use manufacturers' computed programs for analysing takeoff in their operations manuals. An international airline may operate on many run runways on scheduled service and have even more alternate to which its aircraft may be diverted. This makes electronic data processing a necessity. Modern aircraft can also have the information in the pilot's electronic flight bags or installed in the aircraft's flight management computer. 
FMC. This information was normally presented in graphical form in the FAA Airplane Flight Manual. It's the task of the airline's performance engineer to digest it and apply it in a simpler form for flight deck use. Our talk tonight will follow the old graphic, graphical methods. Let us start here with the end result of the analysis. The airline's particular operations manual, not the FAA AFM, will have a page for every runway from each end that the aircraft are likely to operate from. And here you see such a page. I will show you how the crew can quickly obtain the weight and the speeds and the thrust settings before takeoff. As you can see, uh, you have on the top right hand side the fixed uh, parameters that don't change uh, the airport runway length. Uh, we'll talk later about the clearway and stopway available and uh, runway slope, etc. Now, now, from that, you can go into the big main graph and reading up uh, with the outside air temperature, all in degree C by the way in this case, you read across to the runway uh, wind, the wind that is directly down the runway, to find a wind line that's all marked in red, and then you read across and you will come up with a maximum, uh, weight, maximum weight at brake release. You will also see that once you've got the maximum weight at brake release, you can now look down and you can see uh, tabular tables there which show the V1, VR and V2 speeds that are applicable. And on the right hand side you have several little blocks showing how you must make small variations to these, uh, to these results. And the information is then transferred uh, by the crew to a quick reference card fastened somewhere in a prominent place in front of the pilots. Here you can see we have our maximum gross weight in kilograms as it happens and you have a V1, VR and V2 and you have the engine pressure ratio there which is, shows settings for both wet and dry. We can explain that later. And uh, that's about what we need. And this, of course, it applies to a particular runway under certain conditions. It's London Heathrow, uh, runway uh, 24 left, 28 left, and the actual atmospheric conditions, the QNH, the temperature, and that's about it there. And this is just generally put at a very convenient and obvious place in front of the pilots to read and so they can take action on it straight away. Now we look at the how, how this actual information is, is accessed to make this very simple operation for flight deck people uh, come about. And here we have uh, some diagrams and the top diagram shows an aircraft accelerating from rest, an engine fails at a speed called V1, the takeoff continues and the 35 foot height point is reached. This a height point of 35 feet is something which comes out of the regulations. So we have a takeoff distance that is defined as a horizontal distance from brake release to the 35 foot height point. And we have defined something, but we won't be talking about it later. They talk about the takeoff run, and that's the distance from uh, brake release to a point midway from the point of liftoff to when the aircraft reaches 35 feet. That's um, shown there very clearly as being the takeoff run. And uh, it, now we have to look at this clearway, where clearway is area beyond the end of the runway without hardened surfacing but which meets other requirements. It could be a stretch of water, for example. It may be added only up to a certain amount. So you will notice when we do the graphs later, they show only show a permit a certain amount. Uh, and this can be added to the runway length to arrive at the takeoff distance available. And this top picture shows a clear wake clearly being used. And 
an obvious statement, the takeoff run may not exceed the runway length. Now, the lower picture on the other hand shows a, um, a normal all engines operating takeoff. By the way, the top one showed one engine inoperative. And in this case, again according to the regulations, this distance must be increased by 15%. So the possibility arises that the all engines operating case, in other words we're looking at all engines operating case in this case, because of factoring at more runway and distance, it may need more runway and distance than the one engine in operative case. In the next figure, we, we have a situation the aircraft has now accelerated from brake to release to a certain speed, an engine failure occurs and the pilot applies maximum wheel braking. He then manages to bring the aircraft to a stop using all the distance capable of supporting the aircraft weight without causing structural damage to the aircraft. This distance, as, as you can expect, is called an accelerate stop distance and is the total of runway length plus any additional hardened area beyond the runway able to, to support the aircraft and meet certain other requirements. And so the stopway section can be weaker than uh, the normal runway because it's, it's not engineered for normal aircraft landing loads and even taxi loads and it would be able to accept the rejected very rare takeoff. Okay, we can now start thinking about the speed V1. It is the speed at which engine failure occurs and the continued takeoff distance will not exceed the takeoff distance available. Or, this is the other alternative, V1 is the speed at which the distance to bring the aircraft to a full stop from this speed will not exceed, exceed the accelerate stop distance. In accordance with the FAA rules, uh, the tremendous retarding thrust, uh, action of thrust reverses, which is uh, fitted to practically all jet airliners, is not considered. I'll have to qualify this and say there are some changes that apply in certain situations, but for our exercise today, thrust, thrust, thrust reverses that are, are not considered. And of course, these thrust reverses can result in accelerate stop distance being shorter than those calculated. Uh, moreover, the one engine inoperative continued takeoff is always demonstrated for the most, most critical engine failing. With a four engine aircraft, with them on the wings, it will of course be one of the outboard engines. The asymmetric thrust condition results in increased drag, failure of an inboard engine is naturally an easier situation to handle. Another concept in multi-engine performance to get our head around is that of balanced and unbalanced fields. Fields equals runways. You, I'm sure in your aviation uh, exposure, have often seen that aircraft's range is often specified as op the aircraft has operated from a balanced field length of so many meters or feet. So a balanced field is where the takeoff distance is equal to the accelerate stop distance. Now here we have the situation where we show all three different uh, takeoffs and rejected takeoffs. All these aircraft are at the same gross weight and these actual um, takeoff distances have all been worked out from the graphs. So don't worry about this, this is only for illustration purposes. So the upper picture represents a balanced field since the 35 foot height point on taking off with an engine failure is exactly the same to, and, uh, to the complete standstill point. Notice the two aircraft are, are one above the other in the first thing. So we have a thing where um, 
This balance field is defined as the length of level runway which under zero wind conditions will permit the same gross weight for takeoff as the actual takeoff distance and accelerate stop distance available under the real runway slope and wind prevailing. So we have a ratio we have to get our head around here and it's V1 divided by V1B. And uh, because, because they are both the same in this case, V1 by V1B is equal to 1. In the middle picture, we've added a thousand feet of clearway onto a runway. And interesting enough, this runway length is now only 10,200 feet. And we, we notice we, we can be shortened by this 800 uh, feet. Should an engine failure now, the engine's failure speed of 140, 45.5, and the, the continued takeoff can, can be done normally over, just over the clearway. On the other hand, if full braking is applied at this point, remember it's a lower V1, the aircraft will not be able to stop in remaining distance available. To stop V1, this is called out sooner at 140.7. That's the middle picture. And the ratio of V1 by V1B here is 140.7 divided by 145.5. And that gives us a ratio of 0.973. The lower picture shows stop wave in use. And that only decreases the runway length when the engine inoperative field length without stopway is less than the all engine operating takeoff. A decrease of 300 feet is still available with the use of stopway in this example. And of course, if we stopway, uh, if the V1 be called out, called out at 145.5 as before and an engine failure occurs, aircraft will not reach 35 feet in the takeoff distance available on using three engines. So we set V1 at 149 and knots that is. Uh, that means the aircraft can continue um, accelerating over a shorter distance remaining with one engine inoperative to reach 35 feet. At lower speeds than this the takeoff will be rejected and guess what? With the additional accelerate stop distance that the stopway has provided, this is a safe procedure. The aircraft will stop by the end of the stopway. So in this case, the ratio V1 by V1 by V1B is 1.032. We now discuss the other type of speeds. The speed VR is, is at which the aircraft is able to rotate about its main wheels to a certain attitude for it to attain the V2 climb speed at 35 foot height point. VR must always be greater than V1. If it wasn't, this means that what would happen is you would be uh, uh, rotating your aircraft, then seeing V1, then putting the nose down, putting the aircraft back on the ground and obviously the, this, this is not uh, anything logical. Now our V2 climb speed is in turn a demonstrated speed at a 35 foot height point and must never be less than 1.2 times the stall speed in the applicable takeoff configuration. And we also have two minimum speeds we are concerned about. The first is the minimum uh, control ground speed, which is called VMCG. And we make, by making V1 always greater than this, remember the aircraft is still on the ground at V1, it ensures that once the aircraft is committed for flight, it is fully controllable by aerodynamic control surfaces alone, and should be with one engine failed. And of course, this control surface is the aircraft's rudder or rudders. The second uh, critical speed we have is a speed called VMCA, and this is the minimum speed at which the aircraft is controllable in the air with the wings banked five, five degrees and the most critical engine suddenly failing while the others are still producing cycle th thrust. And VR must always be at least 1.05 times the speed 
and we have a V2 is 1.1 times it. This ensures that once this aircraft with one engine failed will be fully controllable when it's committed for flight and it's in the air. Another type of speed is called V1 minimum. This is the minimum speed at which the aircraft may continue its takeoff after, after an engine failure. A little thought about that will convince you how necessary this engine this is. If you had to call out a very, very low V1 you, uh, and you have a lot of runway ahead and you commit to flying, who says this aircraft is going to be at 35 feet by the end of the runway? So, in other words, with, without a V1 minimum, the aircraft must be accelerated by one less engine over a longer distance compared with a faster V1. If the takeoff speed is takeoff is continued, V1 minimum ensures that the 35 foot height point will be reached in the takeoff distance available. The tardy understanding and application of these three critical speeds in the history of multi-engine aviation has resulted in many, many serious accidents. Now what are the variables concerning the aircraft itself uh, which affect the maximum allowable takeoff weight? Have a look at them. First of all, the effect of incorrect power setting hardly needs any explanation. Excess thrust will improve takeoff performance and vice versa. Engines often have more than one takeoff thrust setting and uh, we could have a long talk about that where today we use flexible or percentage power settings. But let's just assume that the aircraft will be using 100% of its available power all the time. The engine's power output is measured on gauges showing N1. N1 is the speed of the shaft of the big fan, to put it simply. And uh, it's shown as a percentage. And the other one, measurement of power generated, is called EPR, engine pressure ratio. That's the ratio of the higher pressure back in the on in the exhaust um, near the exhaust nozzle compared to the uh, air at the fan. And of course we know that engine thrust drops off with ambient temperature rise and decrease in air pressure, both of which affect a density. Low density means that a smaller mass of air is handled by the engine and accelerated rearwards, therefore less thrust is produced. In this uh, top picture, we can see how outside air temperature affects engine thrust. And we can just see there's a direct relationship between the way that thrust decreases as air temperature increases. It's a direct straight line. Now, aircraft manufacturers, and probably for everybody involved, they don't like dictating um, uh, thrust as being as being uh, variable throughout the temperature range. So what they do, sometimes they will have cut off that and put a horizontal section on that line and say, this is called a flat rating, you can maintain maximum thrust up to a certain outside air temperature and over that temperature, uh, thrust will decrease. Maximum thrust settings obtained on the horizontal portion of the line are referred to as flat and with those on the sloping section are called full. Now, the engine thrust is limited by another factor uh, regarding temperature. In red you can see we have um, a TI, that's turbine inlet temperature, of 800 degrees C. And what happens is as the outside temperature goes up, you can only add a certain amount of extra heat to the engine but you cannot exceed the 800 degrees turbine limiting temperature. So we can always say that T1 is equal to T ambient plus delta T and an example is shown there with figures. We will now just look and we'll do this later uh, 
but there's obviously a chart, a power setting chart, and it's showing what EPR to set up for for um, for takeoff. Uh, obviously, using outside air temperature, ambient pressure, and then there's another factor that's showing the turbo compressors, which we'll talk about a bit later. And this picture shows a, um, a typical uh, twin spool turbofan engine without its cowlings on. And in this case, and it's about thrust reverse, we have two thrust reverses. There's one for the fan in the front, and there's a further one for, for handling hot turbine air further to the rear. We'll talk about this thing later, it's called the turbo compressor. But bear in mind the turbo compressor is just another source of power loss to the engine uh, when it is selected on. Now we have power loss to secondary systems. Uh, for instance, bleed air that's used for anti-icing of the airframe and also for pressurization and air conditioning. And one American airliner was fitted with a bleed shuttle valve that automatically closed air conditioning in the event of engine failure. In that way, the aircraft was then certificated to a slightly higher uh, maximum takeoff weight. And uh, that's the turbo compressor, of course. And other airlines of a lot of pretty large aircraft, they actually switch off galley power just for the few minutes of when takeoff power is needed. Now, flap setting, of course, is also important. And with shorter runways, greater flap extension exists from a, a um, runway length point of view, but at the same time it adversely affects climb away performance. When, when a long, longer runways are available, the small flap extension is deployed to improve this. And the exact boundary where one flap setting is going to be hard to, diff, is going to be diff, um, more uh, positive than another is, is not easy, always hard, is hard to determine. So in borderline cases, the performance engineer could publish final information showing what the, the takeoff parameters are with different flap settings. And with our aeroplane we're going to, to consider presently, we don't have to worry about this. This aircraft only had or has one flap setting. Then of course you also have wing spoilers. These wing spoilers must be down for takeoff. Or speed brakes, another name for wing spoilers by the way. And next thing we'll show you an undercarriage truck off this particular aeroplane. And these aircraft were fitted, are fitted with anti-skid systems. Old systems were merely bang bang systems on and off, uh, which the pilot could feel on his pedals all the time but the modern ones are all electronic operated with logic. And some aircraft, which I haven't shown, they actually have nose gear braking as well. We also look at tyres and these aircraft on very long runways, uh, they have to, have to spin up to a high speed. So this aircraft is, is fitted with what's called 200 mile an hour tyres and 225 mile an hour tyres. And uh, to keep the centrifugal force within, in limits, uh, if you're not, not going to have the right tyres on, you've got to reduce your gross weight. So, um, in discussing accelerated stop distance and uh, try and get our heads around this, we've got to consider the capacity of the aircraft's wheel brakes to dissipate heat or energy. And each brake assembly can absorb as much as 15 million foot-pounds or 19.28 kilojoules of, of energy. Another thing we just got to think about, what condition are these brake assemblies in when the emergency occurs? Are, they, are the brakes almost worn out or are the brakes brand new? Or even further, what manufacturer of brake assembly is fitted. Um, what they have is a rod, indicator rod on each brake assembly that shows how much wear is left on that brake assembly. Now, will these brakes burn out before the aircraft is brought to a complete standstill? Depending on the runway length, 
V1 must be checked against this V1 maximum bright energy limit. V1 must decrease as maximum weight increases. This is especially necessary where you have long runways with high uh, elevations, for instance Bogota or Johannesburg. This shows a demonstration that had to be demonstrated on a particular aircraft. This is the, the results at the end of the demonstration. So we have this chart here and you will notice there are two straight line graphs. Again, by, by going through the charts, you can see that your, gro your, your higher gross weights on the green line occur when the V1 speed are, is increasing. At the same time, with the uh, other line, that um, the red line, as the gross weight increases, the V1 speed drops off. So where the two actually intersect one another, that shows the, the optimum point of this. Okay, we've already mentioned about V1 minimum, and we must check for that. We, we pretty much discussed that, all right. Like any structure, the airframe has certain structural limits which may not be exceeded. Regard, regardless of the performance, the structural limits. The one that concerns takeoff analysis is the aircraft's maximum taxi weight, and another weight which we can look at, at is, the, is the maximum in flight with flaps up weight. Because even with flaps up or flaps down, that affects the, the integrity of the structure. And another thing we won't consider, but it's under flight planning, and that is the maximum land, where landing weight of the aircraft. So we can summarize the factors now, which directly affect the operation of our aircraft. And that is shown to us here. We have the runway slope as a percentage, percentage uphill and downhill. What they do is measure the um, height above sea level at each end of, the, end of the runway, divided by the length of the runway times by 100 gives you uh, uphill or downhill slope. Then the wind component, of course, along the runway, it's a, either knots, a headwind or tailwind. Runway length, that's pretty obvious. Clear way we've discussed and stop way we've looked at already, outside air temperature, we know a lot more about that, air, airport pressure altitude, obstacles in the flight path, we're not going to examine that very closely uh, because that's another study in itself. So whoever is responsible for this runway analysis has to have up-to-the-date information as to anything that's constructed in the, in the, in the flight path. Then, of course, there's noise avoidance areas, and there's also runway surface conditions. We're going to assume um, actual smooth dry runway, otherwise this exercise becomes, becomes very big. We have a, must remember that air density not only affects the engine thrust but also the lifting force um, of the wings. This affects how the aircraft climbs and in accordance with regulations the aircraft must achieve a certain minimum climb gradient as it climbs away with its undercarriage retracted at V2 speed to a certain safe altitude prior to retracting the flaps. You have often seen photographs of test prototypes with circular sighting targets painted on the fuselage sides. This is to visually measurement, measure and record the climb gradients. And the, the part of the climb gradient we're interested in is called second segment climb limit and it can limit the gross weight at hot and high airports as we mentioned before. Yeah, we just have a diagrammatic representation of the flight path after takeoff and uh, just bear in mind uh, that we are interested in that second uh, segment portion over there. And in our graphs we talk about WAT, that stands for weight gross weight for altitude and temperature. Now, how is the poor pilot going to work all this out with everything else he's got on his mind before departing?
This to do successfully, as you'll see in the second part, involves no less than 13 chart lookups. We obviously understand why we have to have pre-calculated takeoff performance. Here we just see a few representations. Uh, this is Qantas Airways uh, taking off to Johannesburg, runway 09. Um, each airline has slightly different representations of what they, what they have. And you will also see that there's a watt limit on there, show the various uh, wind speeds. This shows Qantas again, this time in New York, a particular runway. You'll notice hey, this one is good enough for both sides of the runway, isn't it? 13 right or 31 left. This again is another runway in 727 this time, plane. But you can see that the watt limit applies there, wait for altitude and temperature across the top. Another one again, this is only watt limited on this, these long runways. Uh, this actually is, shows two different models of the 727, the ones that are lower gross weight. So the only limit is the, is the wait for altitude and temperature limit. And that is the end of my introductory part of this talk. And what, what I have on the second part is to, to thank people like the Boeing Company, Airbus, Qantas, uh, West Australian, Royal Australian Air Force Museum, Library and South African Airways for using the materials and the help of their staff. And uh, take it easy now and we'll be getting back to the second half presently. This is now the worked example, uh, which is an actual practical uh, way of, of explaining so you get a better idea of what we've been talking about. So we're going to use the approved FAA imp information and the, as before it relates to the Boeing 707-320C, which by the way was the most uh, uh, model Built, built in the greatest quantities and it's got four Pratt & Whitney, JT3D, turbofan engines and this airline was the last airliner was the last of several versions that's the 320C and 800 707s were built altogether and around about a thousand KC-135s and they are still available today. These are the tanker transport aeroplanes, of course, as you know. And we will assume that we use water injection to augment thrust that we will not be using. And that each engine without this water injection uh, delivers 18,000 pounds of thrust under standard sea level conditions. And we also have these turbo compressors. It's got three and this analysis will be done assuming that we're using two. And the wing flaps are selected to the single takeoff position as we mentioned earlier. It's uh, 14 degrees down. Wheel brakes, we mentioned anti-skid, they will be selected on. And we will initially start with 200 mile an hour tyres. Maximum taxi weight of this particular version, 336 thousand pounds and the maximum in flight weight of 335,000 pounds and for your interest sake an operational empty weight was about 149,000 pounds so of course everything greater than operational empty weight is uh, passengers, uh, freight and fuel and we will not consider obstacles in doing this as we mentioned earlier and the variables at the airport, this is the actual variables now. Here we have them all. I don't think we need to. They have been chosen to let you get the most information and understanding of the subject. So that's why they might be a bit weird in what has been selected here. But that's what they are. And at the runway surface smooth and dry, we're talking about no runway grooving or rubber smears. So we'll first look at the charts to establish the effective takeoff distance, ETOD. And you will you will note on this chart it's takeoff distance by the way, it's not stopping distance. 
and it, you look into this chart, you'll see we, we have a runway length of 11,000 feet, we add the clearway, uh, we go to the slope, uh, we read across for the wind, and we read, read down, we, we come up with effective takeoff distance of 11,450 feet. Now that's the all engines operating case. Now we look at the one engine failed case, one engine in operative case. And we, we go into this thing, you can see we're working with a runway distance and clearway. And at the bottom we're reading the actual uh, runway length and allowing for stopway. And in this case there's no stopway. And the intersection of these two lines up in this web, as you can see up there, they give us a V1 by V1B of 0.93. If we read diagonally downwards and to the reference line and to the right, while carrying out the field length conversions, give an effective takeoff distance of 11,400 feet, that is. In this case, if we looked at the two distances, remember one was 11,450. The three engine is only marginally less than the four engine takeoff. And of course we're going to use the smallest of these two distances because so that becomes the effective takeoff distance. We use this distance to calculate the field length limited gross weight. And here you can actually look at that you start with your effective takeoff distance, uh, you read across and you'll come up with your gross weight now, which is um, 314,200 pounds. Do you notice the little graph in the left-hand top corner with the red lines in it? Uh, remember we talked about engine power setting and flat and full rating. And by going into this little graph, we can see we are not in the prohibited uh, hatched area of the graph. And that shows that this is the right graph to use. There is another graph, by the way, which, um, which you use um, where these atmospheric conditions weren't satisfied. Now, just remember that, uh, that maximum weight, that's 314,200. And here we look at our tyre speed limit with 200 mile an hour tyres fitted. Again, we do the corrections temperature, altitude, wind, allows us a gross weight at brake release of 308,000 pounds compared with our 314 earlier. Since this is less than the max than the field limit of gross weight, this will normally be limiting. For the sake of example, we said we would assume that making it too hard now, we, we said we would, um, we will now go for the say, okay, the aircraft was originally fitted with 225 mile an hour tyres, for which there was no limitation. Then we look at our WAT, which we know now by is weight for altitude and temperature. And here we've come up with 315,600, that is higher than the field length gross weight, so the latter still remains more limiting. So. What is not an example in this case, limits because of the higher, despite the higher airport altitude, the low OAT of 90 minus 20 degrees C, very unusual of course, counteracts this. So what speed V1 speedless pilots observe? If we look at the engine failure speed chart, and uh, we correct for normal corrections again, and using 314,000 pounds 200, and 0.93 uh, V1 by V1 ratio will give us a V1 of 135.5 knots indicated airspeed. All V1s are, all the V1 speeds are indicated by the way, all the speeds are indicated. And we have V1 MCG. So there's an additional check to do. You read down on the red side of the graph. This is the minimum speed at which, as we mentioned before, at which the aircraft can be controlled uh, with one engine inoperative using only the flight controls and it does not consider nose wheel steering or differential braking. 
And this is checked in the corner there. It shows that the V1 previously read 135.5 was well above this V1 MCG. So as mentioned, the high gross weight in this example needs a higher V1 to make a successful takeoff, not to stop. This ensures that airflow over the control surface alone is sufficient to provide control. Now we've got to look at maximum brake energy. Again, we go through the, the various several steps. And the question we ask ourselves, taking the prevailing conditions into account, especially the weight of my aircraft, at what speed can the takeoff be rejected and all the aircraft's dynamic energy be used up to, as it comes to a successful stop? This has nothing to do with deceleration while stopping. We're looking only at what the physicists call one half mv squared, mv squared, the amount of energy that this body has. We'll discuss that a bit later on. Looking at this chart, we come up with a, a v1 MBE of 130.6 knots. And the v1 speed found earlier was 135.5, uh, which is 4.9 knots higher than the speed uh, which we've just read. This means that should the engine failure be recognized at 135.5 knots and maximum braking applied, the brakes could burn out before the aircraft was born or was brought to a standstill uh, at the end of the runway. The solution, of course, is to work out by how much to reduce the aircraft gross weight that will satisfy V1 and V1 MBE at the same time. So, We've had a look at this before, so this is for real now. It's to find the unique values, value of gross weight and V1 that will satisfy this condition. So he does this by plotting the um, V1 versus uh, the gross weight and varying them. And of course where both intersect, that shows you the optimum condition that, that uh, you must look for, the optimum point. The crossover point shows 132 knots and 308,000 pounds brake uh, release weight. So just as a matter of interest, this is coincidence, but the 308,000 was applicable to what we worked out uh, before. So the, the aircraft is, is now quite capable of using the 200 mile an hour tyres and not 300 mile an hour tyres. Let it run out and tell the maintenance people, that they'll be very pleased to hear that. Okay, we also look at the structural limits against 308,000 gross weight, that's all right. The maximum taxi weight is 328 and we have in-flight weights. So they are not limiting at all. And another V1 limit we talked about was V1 minimum. If you recall the definition of V1, this is engine failure identification speed at which a takeoff may be rejected or continued. But in this case, we have arbitrarily reduced V1 in order to meet brake energy limits. So we've just got to check, only check, that the aircraft will still reach the 35 foot height point in a takeoff distance available with three engines running. Now, we do this by reading backwards through the charts. We take our new gross weight, we read backwards through the charts, and uh, we come to a, a effective takeoff distance of 10,750 feet, uh, as compared to the 11,400 feet previously obtained. And what we now do, we go back into our chart, uh, to establish a new V1 by V1B, uh, which we're going to use to check V1 minimum. Uh, we remember this from our first talk, of course, I'm sure. At, at the, as the first of the first two steps, we take that engine inoperative takeoff chart again, uh, starting with the effective takeoff distance of 10,750, read backwards, make corrections as we go until we hit the reference line. And the, the reference line happens to be V1 by V1B is equal to 1. We now draw a red line, parallel line, parallel to the grid lines, to the top left. 
we now start with the runway length available. We're moving left to right through the chart, top left hand corner, making corrections as we go until this line intersects our parallel line. This shows a V1B, V1 by V1B of 0.85. We also note that the second V1 by V1B of 0.93 was generated previously. Um, more about this shortly. And as a second step, we take the engine failure uh, speed chart again and uh, entering with 308,000 uh, pounds gross weight and you looking at our V1 by, by V1B, which we just got at 0.85. Uh, we, we look vertically downwards, giving a V1 minimum of 121. You can see the V1 minimum there, uh, lower left-hand corner. And then we also, in our previous crossover point, gave a 132 knots, so that was satisfactory. And we've, we've now got a V1 minimum of 121. So the next slide, the next speed we consider is VR. This is pretty straightforward. We know about the criteria that apply in this situation and we see there's 148 knots. Finally we check that it's not less than V1 and nor less than 1.05 times VMCA which is minimum VR which we can confirm directly by reading down to the limiting line on this chart. This confirms the aircraft will be fully controllable in flight with this critical engine failed. Now what is the takeoff speed as the aircraft climbs away after reaching a, a safe flat retraction height of uh, V2? We read the chart for this and there it is there and we make it normal corrections for 308,000 pounds gross weight and that gives us 162 knots and that proves that our V2 will be well above 1.1 times VMCA. Then we look at our engine uh, power setting chart. You've already described it. We know what, it, what it's about. Remember about the turbo compressors. We've been relying on using two of the three as we've been going through. And that gives you an EPR of 1.97. Now we have the results of it. Gross weight, V1. VR, V2, and 1.97. And I hope nobody is too confused by this stage, but I'm just going to explain something to you very briefly, that a concept is used that V1 is not actually one single speed. And don't worry pilots, you don't have to worry about this because you will just go off your charts and see what's there. But there is a whole range of V1 by V1 speeds existing. And they are the two left hand, extreme left hand and right hand points of the grid. The V1 by V1, V1B speeds. And all of the various V1 by V1Bs on that chart will satisfy the three engine go or rejected takeoff at a particular gross weight and they call this concept V1, uh, multiple V1. Now in the case we have just considered the range will cover speeds from, you can see them on the chart again, from one, well we got that V1 by V1B there and then the V1, there's got to be two of them and then we have, we've got two speeds, the green line reading up. They cover a range from 121 to 134 knots. Uh, the left hand point shows V1 and the right hand V1 minimum and the right hand point shows V1 maximum. So we know what V1 maximum is now. It depends on the deceleration rate it, or it provide, uh, that it's relying on the deceleration rate so the aircraft will stop, not the brake energy. But, um, but the next thing is this, we with V1 MBE has decided to reduce it to 132 knots for us. Or to put it another way, if you were a pilot when stopping from 134 knots, I am fine because the deceleration rate will stop me by the end of the runway. 
but unfortunately the brakes will stop functioning completely at some lower speed before this. So we, we can pick a lower V1 by V1B and this puts the aircraft in what uh, the constructors call the go situation earlier in the takeoff run. And this is particularly useful when stopping conditions are influenced by any sort of precipitation um, on the runway. So we can select a V1 down to V1 minimum. Now I hope you have all understood this, uh, this um, uh, uh, thoughts I've been sharing with you today. I know it's quite hard to get your head around some of the concepts and uh, my email address is skypeople, S-K-Y-P-E-O-P-L-E, at doubleinet.net.au and uh, I, I, I welcome anybody who needs any clarification and I welcome your comments and your questions. There are a lot of other things we could have considered here in our talk but let's just leave it at that but if you want to come up with other uh, queries or, or things please don't hesitate to contact me. I'm very happy to have spoken to you today and hopefully you will just uh, respect what performance engineers do and what pilots have to take in account when taking off with a modern jet airliner. And thank you very much for that.